uh, one of the uh, absolutely liveliest, uh, most interesting, uh, most uh, eloquent uh, writers uh, alive and working today uh, in a kind of multi-form way uh, in, in modes that mix fiction, uh, uh, essay, um, diary, uh, photographs, uh, all kinds of all kinds of things that uh, come in. Uh, she uh, uh, born in the then Yugoslavia uh, of Croatian background, um, uh, went into exile in 1993 after things got more and more difficult uh, as the disintegration of the country has been primarily in Amsterdam since then. Uh, author of, of many books um, uh, and, uh, and essays. Uh, Dustin 2016 uh, won a major a Neustadt International Prize uh, for Literature, the kind of American Nobel for the Museum of Unconditioned, Unconditional Surrender. Uh, I also note that you, you'd won that leading Yugoslavian prize back when there was a Yugoslavia, that, uh, that Danilo Kish and uh, Milorad Pavic had won before you, and, and were, uh, Dubravka was the first woman ever to win this prize uh, in, a, in a not exactly feminist-oriented uh, uh, hierarchy at that time. Uh, extraordinarily impressive uh, body of work altogether. So we're delighted to, to have you here. So we will we'll proceed. Uh, Deli and I will be alternating asking uh, some questions and conversation for the first 45 minutes or hour or so, and then we'll have a question and answer after that. Uh, perhaps starting with the, the issue of exile, which has uh, clearly marked, marked your work uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the Museum of Unconditional Surrender, you, you say that the exile feels that the state of exile has the structure of a dream, very nice oneric uh, perspective. It seems as though the exile's biography was written long ago before it was to be fulfilled. Caught up in this seductive and terrifying thought, the exile begins to decipher the signs, crosses, and knots. All at once seems as though we're beginning to read in it all a secret harmony around logic of symbols. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things that makes it particularly uh, wonderful for us to have you here is that you're also trained in comparative literature uh, as a scholar as well as a, as a writer. So it's at that uh, intersection, which is ideal uh, for us. Uh, uh, this, this, uh, this session at the Institute, one of our distinguished faculty, Galen Tikhanov, is teaching a seminar on exilic writing, which he argues is at the heart of today's notion of world literature. And, I, and we're wondering, uh, how has your training as a comparatist informed your notion of literature uh, and literature of exile? Mm. <laughs> uh, the, this question, I mean, needs a, a longer answer. So because uh, all that training uh, and all those formative patterns, uh, they start much, much uh, before then we decide to study comparative literature or to do this and that, or to go to exile, for instance. So for me, those formative patterns, they started um, with the very fact that I was born in Yugoslavia and being born in and living in Yugoslavia was a sort of introduction into comparative studies of any kind, <laughs> you know, because um, First of all, uh, in school, we learned Cyrillic and Latin, um, Latin letters, so they were equal. And, um, and our school books were printed in both. And then we had an official language, which was Serbo-Croatian or Croatia-Serbian. Uh, but also, um, we, had, we were so open because we were listening constantly or going or visiting uh, relatives or whoever in other environments, language environments, which is Slovenian and Macedonian. So um, that already opened, you know, the, if not knowing the language, but I could understand it, you know. And, uh, and TV programs and everything. So in that respect, it was a uh, multilingual, multilingual uh, community. And then plus, my, as my mother was Bulgarian, I, before going to school, I went to Bulgaria with her to visit 
my grandparents. And there it was, they lived in Varna, uh, the town on the Black Sea. And, um, and they were surrounded by, the, by their neighbors, which were Greeks and Armenians and Turks. Uh, and Bulgarians. <laughs> so as a little girl, before going to school, in fact, um, I, I got this, you know, uh, feeling that the world is much bigger than, than what they lived in a small provincial little town, town near Zagreb. So um, then also, what is quite important is that I lived in, um, after the, I was born in 1949, which means that, that after the Second World War, poverty was still on. So uh, it was still, my childhood was deprived of toys and, uh, and uh, dolls and uh, almost anything, even, even the, let's say, picture books. That came much late, I mean, later. So I relied, I mean, my first drawing pads were my mother's books. And, um, and because of that, I quickly, when I learned reading, I mean, I was reading my mother's books. So, so, and then out of poverty, there was a local library and there was totally illiterate uh, girl working there. I mean, she was not a librarian, really. So when I was 10, she gave me Kafka's Metamorphosis and she said, that would be nice for you because it is about the guy who transformed into an into a insect, she said. So, so that's how out of this <laughs> poverty and illiteracy, uh, I got um, uh, something which was pretty rich. Did, they, did, you, did you, do you think that she thought this is, oh, it's an animal story? It's like a fable for kids? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so, so what I want to say is that uh, all of that, um, and somehow I, I very early I got hooked to literature. And of course, I studied comparative literature because I knew in advance that local national literature is boring. So many students of my generation, they enroll comparative literature out of snobbism. You know, we were closer to the bigger world, something like that. Yeah, so, so then what was also formative, it was a very strong department of literary theory. You know that for yourself, that that were the times when literary theory was extremely strong, you know, and then it get weaker. I, I, I have feeling that today nobody, there are no such strong schools anymore, you know, like semiotics, deconstruction, this and that, you know. And um, for me, what was uh, the most formative, they were Russian formalists. There I learned, uh, first of all, everything I should learn about uh, how to be a writer. And then, <laughs> and then also, um, I mean, what, to, what does it mean to read the text, you know? And, um, and then I never thought that I will go, I will experience uh, this um, story of East European and others, of course. But I'm mentioning East Europe, Central Europe, because uh, this area belonged to that, that I will ever especially after the fall of the wall, that I will go to, to an exile. <laughs> but I did. And there, this story, in fact, starts, um, it starts the story about exile as a cultural text, uh, which it is. It is the oldest cultural text ever. It starts from Adam and Eve. So, so um, 
what does it mean? Why, uh, how, uh, you asked me how um, uh, comparatist, right? Uh, what part exile uh, plays in, in all of that? It plays a big part. First of all, I mean, formalism taught us that any exile, in fact, or betrayal of principles is good, you know. It is this defamiliarization. It is estrangement. It is... Um, it is art as technique and and so on devices and so on and so forth so um so exile by itself is defamiliarization you see the world in 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 uh, as being dislocated and deteriorized you see it differently the world is not the same so I would say that exile is that, uh, that, that new perspective. In my case, it was, um, it was this opposition, nationalism, which, which is in case of former Yugoslavia, just a euphemism for fascism and um, versus exile, you know. Um, so uh, when people ask me how come people would run away before uh, because of communism and and in fact you are running away <laughs> from democracy <laughs> so so i i ran away from this one mono perspective and i was choking i couldn't breathe out of that of that uh, control of that forcing me to belong you know as a writer i i simply want my freedom not to belong to anything nor to ideology not to and so on just as a footnote to this uh i mean just note that our, our bulgarian uh english colleague going to kind of his most recent book uh the mm -hmm. birth and death of literary theory on regimes of relevance in Russian uh -huh. and beyond, has a chapter on interwar exiles uh, as a uh -huh. uh, yeah. crit critical period in this. Uh, your answer actually ties very nicely into my, my question, which is a question about migration, uh, which is a major concern, obviously, in your writing, uh, with all its political, social, cultural, literary contexts and effects. Now, uh, two of our seminar leaders uh, this year are teaching on this very subject. Uh, we have Venkat Mani from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and also Mats Rosendahl-Thompson from Aarhus University. Uh, in a recent interview, uh, when you were asked about this question of migration, um, I remember you said something that was very memorable and uh, I'd like to quote it. You said, today I see the world in terms of a constant migration of human cargo and of ideas and influences too of literally everything. The world is obviously supposed to be and actually is a liquid place. We all swim in the same waters. Now, my question to you is, how do you see migration today? And how does this shape your own identity as a writer? When I, a couple of years ago, I was writing about migration and then it was 60 million people on the road. Today, the figure is 80 million. It is, it is 79 million point five. So almost 80 million people. And uh, I think that, that first of all, um, and also what is interesting, the, the small number of those people are knocking on the door of Europe and the panic uh, because of refugees is bigger than anywhere else, you know. And you have also uh, an enormous, I mean, you have also, I mean, terrible, terrible um, um, 
treatment of refugees. You have read recently, probably in Guardian, that uh, Croatian police is beating those people, uh, taking their cell phones, I mean, uh, spraying their, you know, uh, scalp with the, with the red cross and such things. I mean, humiliating them totally. And um, of course, Croatian police doesn't want to admit that, but people are witnessing. I mean, people are showing their, you know, wounds and, and, and everything. So you can't avoid that, as I would say, probably uh, the most important thing going on in the world. You know, 80 million people is, is a figure. It's not an incident. It's a process. And um, first of all, me as a writer, it teaches me humility. As Joseph Brodsky, long time ago, he said that exile is a lesson of humility. I think that we are getting now this one with with um, with migrants, um, how we are um, um, in fact and cr confronting the fact that we are all uh, fine, that we all live protected lives, you know. So so uh, that's that's it. Also. What they want to say is that um, that will probably, what I don't like, uh, I don't like uh, the, I, the manipulation in our culture uh, with, uh, with migrants, with that, that huge number of people, because you have this false political correctness, people would give some statements, you know, in a favor, liberals, in a favor of, um, of migrants, but nobody, in fact, does help. Uh, the, the artists, they would immediately do some actions, they would do art, you know, dedicated to migrants. I even, um, met a guy, an artist, who, um, who told me that he's making a sculpture, you know, of a migrant uh, with a uh, luggage instead of his head, uh, like ha-ha. So he's, this is his dedication to the um, global misfortune. Peter of Vogue, so she said that there is a new fashion, something like a migrant chic, you know, like t-shirts or sneakers or this and that, and, you know, and, or, you know, forcing people to write miglit, you know, miglit, migration literature. And this is, I think, um, tasteless. What, what Vladimir Nabokov said, that writers should not have passports. That passport does not make a writer. One, one of the things that migration has meant uh, for many people is migrating into another language community. Uh, and uh, with English now so widespread, particularly uh, for translation of literature and for, for scholarship, hence we have English as our lingua franca here for people from 30 countries. A number of scholars, um, including Emily after we're talking about today in my seminar, have uh, criticized the uh, uh, domination of, dom of English as a global language in the world market, as eliding cultural difference, homogenizing different local cultures, uh, and pressuring writers to be translated to English just to, to win prizes uh, to cater to the, to the West. Uh, but I think uh, you've uh, expressed a more nuanced view of the possibilities of global English as a kind of transit medium. In one of your interviews, you remarked that a writer from Portugal rushes to be translated and published in the Anglo-American market. Why? Because being translated into English brings him a chance to end up in Tokyo bookstores, translated in Japanese. 
in your own experience being translated into 20 or more languages, um, what's, how's it, what's been the ex your experience of English as a medium, either direct translation for you or transit medium, a migrant medium of translation? But it always existed something like a lingua franca, you know. It was, it was before the literary center uh, was France, probably, in 19th century Europe. Uh, and today is English. So, so because of mass media, because of many reasons, you know, and, uh, and because of circulation of things and so on and so forth. I mean, uh, whether it is nice or not, I mean, just or not, um, we are not talking about that. We are talking about that how to communicate. And literature is communication, first of all. You know, it's writers who, who would claim that they write for themselves or whatever. I mean, only people uh, who are problematic mentally, they write for themselves, you know. Uh, so, so we write in order to communicate. Or even on more emotional level, as Marcus said in one interview, I write in order to be loved. So, <laughs> so, um, so that's it. And and English is 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 not only a language, but English also have, especially American scene. I have to say, um, facilitates you know uh, writers who are coming from. Uh, or writing in languages which would never ever be translated if not the whole system which serves that purpose. Uh, you know much better than me before translation studies didn't exist. Now they do all over, you know. And people are interested to translate these from minor languages and so on and so forth. It is different question how much they're paid or well, I mean but but literature lives and it should live out of enthusiasm otherwise it's everything is wrong so so um could I just ask as a, as a sort of footnote is have you found any translations we work sort of annoying or frustrating in any respect or is it um, always just how nice it's good you're happy with them yeah, but you have, you know, you have, I know because I translated um, two or three books from Russian into Croatian, and I know that translating Boris Pilnyak, Naked Year, I was just a translator. And I also know that translated Daniel Harms, his stories, I was a co-author. So translators who are co-authors, they're great. Also a question of, I mean, both the quality of the translation, but also sort of how you are framed by foreign publishers in these different markets. Do you, do you find it sometimes looks like a kind of a caricature or a parody or kind of, you know, stereotype or kitsch uh, of yourself? Uh, so my experiences are, are not, are not uh, I mean, big, but they're certainly very often painful. Uh, because, you know, all this ideal and the world of ideal uh, publishers, ideal old-fashioned, you know, editors who would do anything to bring new generations of writers and to take care of them, in spite of the fact whether they are profitable or not, that time is gone. Nobody stands behind you anymore, you know, uh, in this whole literary world. Just a fan here and a fan there, but those people are powerless. Well, I also think, uh, as you yourself said, um, there's also a, a good side to, to this translation via English. I remember in an interview you uh, spoke very beautifully about how you take pleasure in recirculating through your own works 
the works of writers you love, whom you think they are marginalized uh, without, you know, uh, uh, justice to that, and that you feel that through your books, you also get to recirculate them and hopefully also uh, attract the attention of the English translator or the English editor or some other editor to those particular writers? Do you, do you still find that in, in your writings? I must say, because two years ago I was in America and then I had a small, a small uh, tour because my no last novel, uh, Fox, was published. And, uh, and also another book, which was republished after 25 or almost 30 years, and that is American Dictionary. So I traveled a bit, and, and I realized that I said to people I met that this is like in the communism, and they said, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Again, your humor, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 it's, it's absolutely a communist structure, cultural structure, where you had official culture and you had underground. You had underground culture, you know? Because I know that official culture is centered in, let's say, New York. Everybody is Russian, people, young people, they go to New York, they move there because they know that cultural center is there. Like before, Americans were rushing to Paris because the cultural center was in Paris. So, uh, but at the same time, you know, so all what is official comes from, let's say, New York. I'm now exaggerating. I mean, I'm just pushing and I shouldn't. And then, you have underground life, literary life. And this is something I was delighted to find out, you know, starting from, let's say, uh, Portland. Everybody is talking that, I mean, that, that bookstores are dying. Fine, but in Portland, you have four in the town and one in the airport. How come, you know? How come that everybody from American writers, they rush to Portland? Why? Because there is a person, David Nyman, there, and his, his pod, podcast, which is podcast, which is called Between the Covers. He's the only person, otherwise he earns money for living as an acupuncturist. But he himself is a poet, is an author, as well as his wife. And he does um, this podcast and also the site. So all writers, they rushed, including Ursula Le Guin, they rushed there to talk to him because he's intelligent, devoted, excellent interlocutor, you know, who would, lead, who would give you a space of one hour. And now tell me, who in America would talk with the writers for one hour? Nobody. <laughs> no? Except us here, we get to, so we get the, we get the pleasure here. Uh, in, in one of your interviews, you've spoken about the outsider's position and describe yourself as you'd always be an outsider, both in a national but in a bigger literary game. Uh, and you said, because also as you're a woman and a woman working in a small language and coming from a part of the world where literature and culture were, were not priorities. Uh, and, but you describe yourself as free to shape your own literary taste, pick your own literary tradition. Um, think of this in relation also to Derek Walcott or or Jorge Luis Borges have had, had similar things uh, as well. Uh, uh, for, for many of our group this summer, this I think strikes home. Can you tell us a bit more about the advantages of being an outsider um, in the world around us and the literary world? What has this uh, uh, helped you to, to do and to, uh, and to see? I didn't start as outsider, in fact, because I, in, former Yugoslavia, I got this prize, NIN prize you mentioned, yeah. 
uh, when we were all together and um, and they had pretty I would say happy uh, happy career I was free to choose whatever I wanted to write about and they did you know and then when Yugoslavia fell apart in fact the whole system I was functioning fell apart suddenly from one language we got four languages you know Croatian, Serbian, Bosnian, and even Montenegrin. And everybody knows that this is the same language, but somehow as language is political question, now those languages are separated. This is one thing. Uh, I was forced to be Croatian writer because of passport, this and that, and other writers just because of, you know, they didn't want to protest in those dangerous times, or they agreed with all of that, they uh, are now separated into Croatian, into Bosnian, into and so on writers. So the most, um, let's say, um, the, the most uh, funny destinies of Ivo Andrich, who is an ethnic Croat, okay, but then he lived all his life either abroad, but later, uh, after the Second World War, he moved to Belgrade, and he wrote about Bosnia. So when the state separated, Croats, they said, okay, we are going to take his poetry only <laughs> as a Croatian heritage. Bosnians, they said, no, no, uh, he he wrote badly about us Muslims, so we don't want him. And Serbs, they said, fine, he's a Nobel Prize winner, so we will take him. <laughs> <laughs> and you have many of such of such uh, stories, which just tell you about about um, about uh, destruction of and the impossibility to belong to such a culture. Not for me, sorry. I mean, a majority of other people, they agreed. So what, what should they do? And I went to, I went abroad to, in order to not belong to anything. Also, uh, I, proposed in one of my essays in Europe in Sepia book, and the essay is, the title is O-N zone. The, it, it is not U-N zone, <laughs> but it is O-N. And I was inspired by, by a book by Azade Sehan, and uh, she wrote, um, Writing Out of Nation. So out of nation is O-N zone. And, um, I was uh, somehow, because of those migrations, because of many writers who write in that limbo, and I'm experiencing this limbo with my life. I live in Netherlands, I write in Croatian, and I'm concerned to be a Croatian writer, which I'm not, because Croats, they don't like me, as <laughs> Bosnians, they don't like Ivo Andrić. So maybe there'll be your statue in Amsterdam the way there's the Andrej statue in <laughs> Belgrade now. No, I'm just opting for a platform. <laughs> for so many cases of writers which are des dislocated, deteriorized. So how that platform is going to be named out of nation zone, so ON zone, or, or let's say transnational or post-national or whatever, but I know that such people do exist and they don't have a uh, theoretical or uh, cultural or some platform they could live uh, on. Yeah, I was, I was just meditating on uh, uh, something that I've, I've noticed that you, you do in all your interviews as well as your writings, uh, yeah. which is, I think, is, it's like an amazing willingness 
uh, that's actually really moving uh, to turn any kind of disadvantage into an advantage. And I really think this is a really wonderful and positive take uh, on to, you know, accepting one's condition in life and just making the best of it. And one of these instances, I think, where you really make the most of it is when you talk about the uh, relationship of a semi-peripheral writer to her translator. And in an interview from 2014, you said this is a very special relationship. And you said this is extremely interesting, especially when it comes to translation from a smaller language. If I belong to a bigger literature, were I an American or an English writer, for example, I probably wouldn't be happy about not seeing my work appear in lesser used languages. But for someone who, who writes in a small language and who comes from a cultural environment polluted by nationalism and other forms of exclusion like gender exclusion, to have one's work translated into a foreign language and evaluated by readers abroad is a matter of survival. It feels like oxygen. A writer starts to breathe. Uh, and I, as you said, you also translated from, from Russian. And I was wondering uh, how you would define today uh, translation uh, as a writer, as a scholar, and also as a reader of world literature, because you're such a great reader. Uh, translation is an oxygen for me, you know, and I, I noticed that, that, that really, if you belong to some uh, big language or literature or a big language like English, then you don't really care. It's uh, just uh, exoticism to be translated into Macedonian, let's say. Uh, so it's not, it's not important. And um, uh, I mean, nothing can give you uh, this, you know, sense of self-importance. I mean, because you are already important <laughs> belonging to such a big language. That's normal. I would behave the same way. Uh, if I would write in English, for instance, and be incorporated into Anglo-American literature, okay? But for me, it, I wouldn't be a writer without translation. For whom should I write, by the way? To go back to Croatia? you know, and not being published or not being appreciated because, because I do not belong to that national cultural construct. I don't want to belong to that. So without my translators, I would be dead, you know. And then also what is important, that uh, the, the getting appreciation communication, being understood. Today, I think I am better understood in America than in Croatia. At one point, I was much better understood in Poland, let's say, than in Croatia. And so on and so forth. It's this extremely, extremely um, interesting to follow Without, it's not a, I mean, matter of vanity, but I'm still a former scholar. So for me, <laughs> it's important to, you know, it's interesting how your book works in different language and cultural environments, you know. That's why I'm so happy to have uh, you know, readers in India, for instance, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are not many of them, maybe one or two, but that is enough, you know, to make my position uh, so legal. In your case, you're crossing borders, uh, not only uh, uh, geographic and political ones, but also of, of genre uh, in what are called your novels. You also I mean, I think in the Museum of Unconditional Surrender, is all, suddenly there's an essay on Kobakov uh, appears uh, there, uh, and you've written whole books of essays themselves that seem very uh, Montaigne-like, very autobiographical. Um, uh, I'm curious how, how you feel as an essayist versus as a, as a novelist. Do you see them as 
very separate modes of writing or that they kind of bleed into each other for you? First of all, I think I, 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 I wrote some proper novels, you know, like Fording the Stream of Consciousness, like uh, Ministry of Pain. They are proper novels with the story, with the plots, with the characters, this and that. And then I also wrote the novels, unproper ones, which do not follow this uh, structure of the novel we learned uh, in school. Um, so what I want to say that I'm writing, first of all, for my ideal reader. And uh, my ideal reader fits very much into fantastic quote, I'm going to read it, fantastic quote by Italo Calvino, who said in, a, uh, in his book, uh, who do I write for, uh, or the hypothetical bookshelf. Uh, it is published in 1967, and he said, literature is not school. Literature must presuppose a public that is more cultured and more cultured than the writer himself or herself. Whether or not such a public exists is unimportant. The writer addresses a reader who knows more about it than he does. He invents a himself or herself who knows more about it than he or she does. To speak to someone who knows more still. Literature has no choice but to raise the stakes and keep the betting going, following the logic of situation that can only get worse. In that respect, First, I was, uh, I mean, it is not, it is not um, nice, I mean, to, you know, follow some reactions on, on your novels or, or essays. Essays are not essays and novels are not novels, you know, uh, for, the, for the reader, you know, or that I would say, uh, um, reader with expectations <laughs> and I many many times I would uh, read protests oh this is not a novel <laughs> or wow this is not an essay what is it it is a story is it truth or not and so on so um, whom I am supposed to please then or fill in his or hers expectations. Uh, an anonymous reader who would execute me on good reads and similar sites with the following comment. Once I read this comment, uh, this is something incomprehensible, something Slavic. <laughs> I will prolong um, disappoint such a, such a readers. So I think that combination in between essay and novel is maybe more, um, let's say, understandable in European culture and especially in uh, languages or literatures like Hungarian and, uh, and Russian and uh, Brodsky's essays, let's say, what are they, essays or literature or what, you know. And to say that essay for me is also the most comfortable uh, form. It became after, uh, after the, the, the war in Yugoslavia, started in Yugoslavia because I could express uh, my, my opinion uh, quickly and in a way that others would understand and uh, uh, somehow much quicker than in novel, you know. 
and also some of my novels uh, I like their architecture because they are that mix of, of everything and that everything talks to each other and makes a new new meanings because I was actually going myself to to push a little on this question of the the essay as you're saying very specific to this you know central and eastern literature i find it the same in the case of romanian literature especially of the 1970s and also i would say the 1980s so still the, the last decades of communism a question to you is why do you think specifically this form of, of essay is developed in central and eastern europe uh during these uh, uh historical times in the case of danilo kish it was okay or some other writers why is that so i think that um that what differs let's say careers and also texts written by some other writers or some other peaceful environments you know is that specific density you know specific feeling which which even uh, appears in the in the text you know uh, specific feeling that you have to say what you have to say because maybe tomorrow you wouldn't be able to do so you know i myself i never ever thought that i would follow the destinies of some east european dissidents you know uh, that I would experience war, never, you know, but I did, you know, and I, I think that's why uh, that former East European literature, it didn't have, it was not relaxed. People would never write fantastic novels about football. Because of that, you know, alarm in their brains. I have to say what I have to say because tomorrow they will shut up the team uh, of football or whatever. You know. True, true. And also literature was a very serious business, right? It was the... Yes. Uh, and I miss that. I know, I know, I know. I, I miss it too. Uh, yeah. But uh, one of... The, the um, essayistic pages I totally love, uh, we can find in your book, The Ministry of Pain, where you speak of a recurrent concept in your writings, which is Yugo nostalgia. And mm. that's a nostalgia for the times when Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia were one country that spoke one language. And I felt that your Yugo nostalgia uh, was also connected with, with the problem of, of cultural and linguistic translation, as, as it happens in Tarkovsky's film Nostalgia, right? Whose title Tarkovsky insisted in, in keeping in Russian, even for the international distribution. In the Ministry of Pain, you describe nostalgia as something that makes its appearance in translation, and you write, most often a bad one after a complicated journey, not unlike the children's game telephone. The words the first player whispers into the year the next to him pass through a whole chain of ears until it emerges from the mouth of the last player like a rabbit out of a magician's hat. Does the translation of your own works generate for you this kind of nostalgia, albeit it was actually thanks to translation that many of us can read you today? I mean, the trickiest thing is with nostalgia, you know, uh, because it first appeared, as you know, as nostalgia, uh, the term coined in East Germany uh, as a nostalgia for, for Ost. And, uh, and then uh, there was a co coinage of Yugo nostalgia, which is pretty nice, I would say, but with a very, very bad um, meaning, you know, because it was, it was coined by, I think, mostly by Croatian uh, media men uh, as a form of accusations. Yugo nostalgia didn't mean anything else for them than 
uh, supporting or being for communist regime or for Tito or for dictatorship and so on and so on, which was not truth because Yugoslav past was prohibited in Croatia especially. You could not mention even popular culture, you know, nothing uh, from that Yugoslav era. And they really managed to erase that, um, that, that, that uh, past. And then I was very active. I, I wrote an essay, Confiscation of Memory, you know, because I thought that they will delete people's, people's memories. You know, maybe my mother wanted to, to watch, let's say, a TV show produced by Belgrade as, or Macedonia, as she always did. I mean, and now everything was cut and stopped and it should be only creation, you know. But that was the time, 1991, when I wrote that essay, thinking that the whole culture will be deleted. It wasn't uh, because of digital, jumping us into this digital era suddenly. You know that internet and all those gadgets came into a wide circulation from 1995. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, uh, I remember I was in Boston, in Cambridge, and a friend of mine, movie director, he found in antiquity shop a poster of his movie. And it was sold for, let's say, 20 or 30 dollars. Uh, and the next day, the price jumped into eight. It's important to, you know, to collect all of that uh, because we will never see it. But then it appeared bit by bit on uh, internet, YouTube, this and that. And now the whole past is, in fact, there. So uh, this level of nostalgia is also uh, satiety, okay? And um, nostalgia by itself is extremely manipulative, a manipulative um, notion and manipulative idea. It doesn't have only one aim, but it could be you know, manipulated politically, this or that, this or that way. And why it is important in a, in a time so such a radical changes is because it defends continuity and new politics, they want discontinuity, you know, uh, and it defends memory remembrance and so on and so on but it also gets commercialized you know and that is that is um, everything is on market you know uh, without hierarchy so uh, people uh, i don't know will get on the market t-shirts with stalin and at the same time cops with Malevich's, uh, you know, uh, painting. And everything is on sale without, without uh, comments. What is right, what is wrong. I have uh, one, uh, just one last uh, question, or actually I have a little quote I'd like to read, I think, uh, building on mentioning your, your, your mother and the, the memories. Uh, and uh, I think that in a number of your, your books, there'll be like a plastic bag that has odds and ends in it. That's a kind of a vehicle for memory. And I, I was just thinking in particular, um, I mean, there's one in the Ministry of Pain, but uh, one that's in the uh, Museum of Unconditional Surrender. And I, I thought I'd just uh, bring this. So here, uh, uh, here after the collapse of the country, um, uh, you know, the, the narrator's mother, I don't know if it's your mother, but the narrator's mother gathers my father's old medals for brother, brotherhood unity into a heap, puts them in a plastic bag. Uh, as though they were human remains, saying, sadly, I don't know what to do with these. Why don't you leave them where you, they were, says the daughter. What if someone finds them? I said, nothing. You take them, she pleaded. Now, from there, it could be a next sentence would go. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, my mother, 
uh, that despite everything, kept tenaciously to a dogged ritual visits to my father's grave. That would be a sentence that follows that. But that, that sentence is like one of your mother's, the mother's bag. You open it up. And what's inside that sentence is these other clauses. But nevertheless, that same year, when the names of the streets changed, when the language in the country and the flags and the symbols all changed, when the wrong side became right and the right side was suddenly wrong, when some people were afraid of their own names, when others apparently for the first time weren't afraid of theirs, when people were butchering each other, when some were butchering others, when armies with different insignia sprang up on all sides, when the strongest set out to obliterate everything from the face of their own country, when terrible heat waves laid the land bare, when a lie became the law and the law a lie, when people pronounced nothing but monosyllabic words, blood, war, gun, fear, when little Balkan countries shook Europe maintaining rightly that they were legitimate children, when ants crawled out from somewhere to devour and tear the skin from the last descendant of the curse of tribes, when old myths fell apart and new ones were feverishly created, when the country she had accepted as hers fell apart and she had long since lost and forgotten her first one, when she was scared by heat in her flat as it radiated from the baking concrete in the concrete sky, when the panic-stricken light of the television flickered day and night, when she was racked by the icy fever of fear, dash, now the rest of the sentence, my mother, despite everything, kept tenaciously to her dogged ritual visits to my father's grave. I just think that's the most amazing sentence I, I've read in years, uh, I, I would say. Uh, and I wonder if you might um, just talk a bit about how, how that sentence has opened up with all these things inside, like one of these, one of these bags. Um, mm -hmm. What's inside yeah, that bag way. for you now? But, but there is another bag also in the... Ministry of Pain. There is another one which is typical for emigrants and uh, to it, its plastic is extremely cheap, is usually big and I even saw in Amsterdam um, uh, there was a nice art project that people built a little house as a, as a art object uh, made of this of these bags, you know, emigrant bags. So. So, uh, I mean, this is all what was happening at the beginning of, that, that is the fall of, of Yugoslavia, in fact, you know, where, and all, all of that, my mother thought, should be raised a star from the, uh, five-pointed star from the grave of, of my father, uh, was precautious. She had this experience which I didn't have. She's older. I mean, she knows how things were changing and how things would be brutal, you know, and how human lives did not matter. And, and she sort of predicted what will be happening soon. And that is that uh, more than 3,000 monuments in Croatia were devastated or simply, um, you know, moved or removed uh, because they belong, they were symbol of the struggle against fascism, you know, uh, for partisans and for this um, uh, liberation movement, resistant movement, uh, all of that is gone. Not only that, but let's say some uh, recent, relatively recent exhibition in MoMA of Yugoslav modernism showed that I, I went there, I saw it, you know, but before that I was visiting a monument uh, which was presented in that in that exhibition as a little, you know, souvenir, as a little sculpture, a replica of that big monument in, in Croatia. And uh, it was done by a famous, uh, famous uh, uh, sculptor. But as he was a Serb, I mean, all his other monuments uh, were devastated and this one also. Totally. I mean, and it is the biggest shame, but nobody does anything because he was a son. It should be deleted. 
you know. So such a, a shameful episodes, you had them uh, for 30 years up to today. And, um, and that's why that urge uh, to remember, to put into the, <laughs> you know, bag, <laughs> to purse, to, to save, to, you know, it's a, it's a human, um, that's why we are humans. I mean, we, we want our memories. We don't want to prohibition on, on, on our lives. That's a beautiful statement. And really your prose does exactly that. Michael, I think we have some questions. Would you like to pose them? Uh, so the first question uh, is from uh, Jesse Van Amelswort. Uh, and he says, Dubrovka, at the beginning of this wonderful conversation, uh, you say that you ran away from nationalism and restrictive ideologies in Yugoslavia. Uh, in addition to where uh, one runs away from, I wonder if it also matters where one runs to. Uh, does it matter for your career, your outlook on things and so on, uh, that you came to Amsterdam rather than some other place? How has being in exile in Amsterdam shaped you? You know, we said at the beginning that, um, uh, that exile is a sort of a dream. So you don't want, you don't go to exile uh, with a plan. You know, I was not, uh, in that respect, I was, I was never a refugee, you know, because refugees are on some track. So I, I just left the country. And, um, and then I, I didn't choose Amsterdam so quickly. First of all, I mean, uh, I was invited to, uh, I got a fellowship in Berlin. So I spent the whole year of 1994, year of 1994 in Berlin. In the meantime, I got a fellowship in Cambridge. It was Bunting Institute uh, Fellowship. And I spent a year in, in Cambridge. And then I, I, I got a fellowship in Amsterdam. And I spent a year in Amsterdam. And by that time, I got pretty annoyed in my age, you know, by just by not having a steady address. So I kept my apartment I used to uh, rent in Amsterdam as that permanent address or some address. After that, I was back in America and back in Amsterdam. And, you know, finally, uh, at one point, I decided to settle. And uh, that was probably the decision. Uh, Amsterdam was a, was a perfect place because, because I was allowed to live in Amsterdam as soon as I had, uh, as I had the money, as I had my address, and as I had something to do. And I did. I was writing for the for the excellent newspapers. I, I, uh, I was welcomed by literary community, which was very lively in Amsterdam. And um, also, I must say that it was quite then literary country. A lot of bookstores, a lot of translations, and so on and so forth. So, so it was a, it was a, let's say, nice environment. <laughs> uh, so the next question is from Matthew Green. And uh, he asks, in thinking about migration language and the relationship to writing, uh, do you find yourself drawn to a specific alphabet depending on the subject matter? Uh, for example, a friend from Serbia told me that she writes in the Latin alphabet for more sterile topics like shopping lists or work emails. Uh, but when she writes in more intimate or emotive contexts, like family birthday cards or emails uh, to siblings, she uses Cyrillic. Uh, now, Croatian only uses the Latin alphabet, but do you, having been raised with both, feel a pull, or could we even say a migration, between the alphabets as you write? No, I write in Latin alphabet, uh, never in, in, in uh, Cyrillic, or I do in Cyrillic, but it is more connected with the Russian 
language, which I know, and Russian Cyrillic letters. So, so, and then also, you know, Serbia, in Yugoslavia, they switched almost completely into Latin letters uh, um, in 90s, and then because of the war and because of the nationalism, they went back to Cyrillic, but not completely. Newspapers are printed in Latin letters, so only when it comes to official documents, they use Cyrillic letters or maybe streets and so on and so on. So it's half and half. Uh, the next question comes from uh, one of our faculty members, uh, Galin Tihanov, and he says, uh, thank you for a great conversation. Uh, now, once again, on the question of nostalgia, which Delia has already raised, uh, how should a writer, especially a writer in exile, relate to nostalgia? Uh, after all, nostalgia uh, cannot just nurture one's writing, but also severely limit one's purview. Uh, Solzhenitsyn, whom you mentioned, is a case in point. Uh, his relentless and at times also tendentious critique of American society was no doubt fueled by his nostalgic praise of uh, Russian Orthodox Christian culture. Uh, could it be that this is why he didn't really write anything artistically significant during his American period? Mm. As I said, I, I can't answer that question because nostalgia has so many faces, you know, and, uh, and so many ways. It's uh, the trickiest of all the feelings and emotions or approaches also, you know. So one should be careful. Uh, with nostalgia, you know, it could lead you into uh, the di directions you would never go. So otherwise, <laughs> so I am, I am careful, you know. And besides, there is something like a struggle for memory. When I was uh, the, the, the teaching at Amsterdam, and part of it is uh, inspired, of course, the novel The Ministry of Pain. Um, uh, I started the project, you know, with my students to uh, simply to, because they were all from former Yugoslavia. Uh, and start, I started with them this memory project. What, what do we remember? What is pain for, from before the war, you know? And, and that was pretty difficult you know, because memories were, of course, <laughs> very, very uh, different. And then a student of mine put that on internet and it became popular within a year or two or three and people were sending their little, little not objects, but descriptions of an object of first Coca-Cola produced in Yugoslavia and such things like nostalgic thing. But then it got commercialized and I was out of that project because it was taken by a publisher and, um, and they published like three editions of it and it was in the hands of people who didn't have really initiated the project or had anything to do with that. And then I also noticed that it became a war. I mean, it started a war uh, of memories, which one will prevail, you know. <laughs> Winners, they, they have, I mean, they, they write history. So uh, in that respect, nostalgia could be subvert, subversive, you know, or it could, have a, you know, it could sabotage the whole thing, which is, which is good. We do have one last question. Uh, it's from uh, Aida says, firstly, hello from Croatia and from someone belonging to a younger generation, uh, which truly appreciates uh -huh. your work. Uh, you've mentioned the That's idea fun. of creating uh, a kind of abstract transnational platform for exiled authors, uh, which cannot conceive of themselves as belonging to any kind of national literature, such as yourself. Uh, would you say that such a platform could or even should have an important political role or even a responsibility in uh, considering the concerning rise of the, uh, the political far right uh, in Croatia as well as elsewhere, uh, which are almost always closely tied to the notion of the nation? Yeah, that's, that's true. But uh, don't forget that for 30 years, 
I'm writing about those those trends in in, <laughs> in Croatian politics and and uh, everyday life, and I didn't succeed to do anything with my writing, you know, apart from few fans like Aida is, I suppose. So 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 it's it's difficult. You know, and uh, to drag people on that platform is also impossible because some people, majority of people, they like to belong, you know. They like to belong uh, to local literature, however they are small, uh, because, because of security, you know, and because of this traditional mo model of literature. Uh, they like to be representatives of Croatian, Bosnian, uh, Serbian literature. They uh, they think that it is something important for them. So who will take out of them? So people who do not want to belong. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of a suicide. I mean, it's not. A, I would say it's not a position, it's, it's a diagnosis almost <laughs> in their eyes. Uh, we just have one final question from one our, of our faculty members, uh, Professor Venkat Mani, who is actually teaching a wonderful seminar on migration. So Michael, maybe you can read the question? Uh, yes, so, so Venkat says, uh, thank you so much for your excellent insights, uh, especially translation is oxygen, uh, which underlines David ideas, uh, David's idea of gain in translation. Uh, and now extending Delia's question on migration, uh, would you please speak a little bit more about your own creative process as migration, as migration into another space uh, or another past? Uh, the Ministry of Pain, which uh, he says he read with Arundhati Roy's Ministry of Utmost Happiness, uh, also translates a gamut of writers through epigraphs, Joseph Broski, Ismail Kadari, and more, uh, as connections or misconnections with the past are made. So how does translation impact the very production of literature. Yeah, that's true, because, uh, because especially uh, my latest novel, and this is Fox, uh, it, it, it is extremely deteriorized. I mean, um, it, it, it is about Russia and Russian avant-garde and the time of Russian avant-garde. It is about Japan and uh, uh, Russian writer writing Japanese stories. It's about me going to Japan and writing about his stories. It's about Napoli. Uh, also, there is a story placed in Napoli. And then there is a story placed in, in a, a, a provincial, uh, in a village of Croatia. And, and so on and so forth in America and London. And, um, and it's, it's, it's it, it, it architecture, architecture of the novel is certainly uh, influenced uh, by, by this, let's say, migration principle. Speaking of your migration, you know, into a different past, a different space, I was also wondering, um, whether there is any kind of way in which you're actually living in Amsterdam, uh, speaking in English, writing as well a, a lot, right? Uh, I wa I'm wondering whether either English or Dutch or both have changed the way you are thinking about creation. Absolutely. Uh, it, it changed because, you know, when you live in a stable and close, uh, let's say, literary environment. And that was for me when I was young, um, that was Yugoslavia. So you presuppose that your readers will understand you without any footnotes or explanations or anything. You would use local humor, you would use local references and so on and so forth. From the moment, and then being so, you know, integrated into community, uh, I, uh, my escape was to write uh, or to care about literariness of literature, you know, and my references were global. And they mostly came from 
uh, either I was uh, following or um, uh, making parodies of certain genres, like in my novel Steffi Zweck in the Jaws of Life, it was the genre of um, of Hertz roman or of romances, uh, cheap literature, and so on. So either I would do something uh, which later on uh, um, was, I mean, uh, recognized as, as something else, uh, but I would do, let's say, um, rewriting of um, of some classical stories like uh, uh, Gogol's Nose or uh, uh, Kreutzer's Sonata or Alice in Wonderland and so on. So it was when I was there, my literature was very, let's say, worldly. When I left my environment, then and I had this urge to explain where I'm coming from in essays or in novels, then I was basically back, but I had a different problem. How to translate reality? How to translate life? It's not the language. It's, uh, I mean, Russians, they have the whole theory about the but, and but, this is everyday life. How to translate it? To be um, recognized or to be understood, you know. And um, I have a million, million uh, examples. Or how can you guess? I mean, even if it is genre, that it is local and untranslatable. Let's say, long time ago, I read um, a science fiction story uh, written by a Czech author. And suddenly I bumped into a sentence. I was uh, staying at her place for a longer time, drinking a whiskey of the best quality. And I thought, how can such a sentence belong to science fiction genre? <laughs> so, why he's staying so long at her place drinking a whiskey of the best quality? Does that whiskey has a name? So immediately I recognized the atmosphere that was Czechoslovakia during the communism. <laughs> there were no drinks like whiskeys of best quality and it was worthwhile to stay in somebody's place for a longer time to drink that whiskey and forget about the genre of science fiction, fiction story. Thank you so much, Dubovka, for this wonderful uh, conversation. <laughs> On behalf of all of our participants for, for a wonderfully illuminating uh, and very rich uh, session. <laughs>